So I'm here today to talk to you about Australia's first hosted mega science project, Square Kilometre Array. This is a billion dollar effort. It's international, involves currently 12 countries, and it will build the next generation of radio telescopes. But it will also push the boundaries of computing in order to deal with the torrents of data that are going to come from the SKA. Now we heard already that Piercy built Sidak in part to address issues with radio astronomy computing. Of course, he was a pioneer and he wasn't always appreciated. I have a quote here, which um, thanks to Ron Ekers for sending it to me, from Mills, who was also a pioneer of radio astronomy. Mills says, at the time, the only way to perform Fourier transforms in a reasonable time was to use the radio physics computer, of SILAC, which was still under development and hardly to be considered an essential part of astronomy observing. Now, of course, Mills wasn't quite on the right side of history with that because computing is absolutely essential for astronomy now, and we couldn't do any of what we need to do without the world's kind of most cutting edge supercomputers. So what is it that the SKA is going to build? Well, 1,000 people working across 20 years are working, have been working towards this. Two telescopes, one in South Africa and one in Australia, both in very remote areas of their country, in South Africa, in the Karoo, which is around 600 kilometers from Cape Town, um, and in Australia, in the Murchison, um, in Western Australia, about 800 kilometers from Perth. And we'll be building two very different radio telescopes. In Australia, on the top, we'll be building a low frequency radio telescope. So a whole field of what look like Christmas trees made out of um, aluminium, probably. And then on the bottom, a mid frequency radio telescope with more traditional kind of radio dishes that you'll recognize from telescopes like ASCAP and PARKS. So in South Africa, we'll have 200 dishes and um, covering frequency range from 350 to 40 megahertz to 14 gigahertz and spread out across 150 kilometers of the observatory. And in Australia, 130,000 antennas in 500 clusters spread across 65 kilometers of the Western Australian desert. But what science will we be doing here? Well, SKA has a really wide range of science goals, um, including tiny, fast-spinning pulsars to test gravity and mapping a million galaxies. But I'd like to talk to you about one particular science goal, and it's a key science goal for the SKA Low Telescope in Australia. And that is, how did the universe look when the first galaxies started to shine? So with the Planck Space Telescope, we have seen how the universe looked through the cosmic microwave background. That's around 380,000 years after the Big Bang. But then we move into what we call the cosmic dark ages. And for around 400 million years, everything is dark as slowly gravity starts to pull matter together so that the first stars and then the first galaxies can start to shine. And we have never yet been able to see this with any instrument. And this is hopefully what we will be able to look at with the SKA. But to do this, we need an absolutely cutting edge telescope. And this gives you an idea of how much better the SKA will be than the telescopes that are currently state of the art. In particular, if you look at the top, you can see that SKA Low, the telescope in Australia, will be able to survey the sky 135 times faster than LOFAR, which is the current state of the art. And it also gives you a vision of how much better the image quality is that we're going to get from SKA than we can have at the moment. And this is absolutely what we will need in order to do these boundary pushing science activities. SKA is so sensitive that it will be able to detect an airport radar if there were one anywhere in the galaxy. Incredibly sensitive. So, how do you move from 
giant telescopes through to torrents of data? Well, first of all, signals come and radio waves are emitted by objects in the universe and they are detected by our dishes or our antennas and there they're digitized. And then they're transferred on 100,000 kilometers of fiber optic. That's enough to take you a quarter of the way to the moon to our central processing facility. And there we use field program, programmable data rays and CPUs to split the signal up into its different frequencies. And SKA will be able to distinguish between 65,000 radio frequencies. So that's 65,000 different colors of radio light, if you like. Each being sampled 4,000 times a second across 130,000 antennas. So it's no wonder that this is big data. And once we split them up into frequencies, there are then two ways that we look at the data. We can look at it in time domain. So we add the data together. We can, take, uh, we can time things to the nanoseconds, so for example, fast spinning pulsars or fast radio bursts. But then we can also process the data in the image domain. So we multiply the data together across the different baselines that we get between each antenna. Yeah? And, um, and in doing that, we get visibilities which then show us images. And there we'll show you some great images later, which you've been doing with Galaxy. Um, but that requires we, we get 65,000 um, frequencies, 130,000 antennas, multiplied across each different antenna. So we get 8 billion data channels out of that calculation. And those 8 billion data channels are then transferred across to our supercomputers. One in Perth at the Forty Centre and one in South Africa in Cape Town. And the supercomputers take those 8 billion data channels um, and then they process them so they can be used by astronomers. And this is really hard. It takes a lot of processing. We have to know the response of the antenna. We have to have a model of the sky. And we have to even know what the weather was like when the data was taken. So that takes up to 250 petaflops of processing. And we have to do it 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because this amount of data is too much data to store. You have to process it as it comes out of the telescope. So really, for, for the very first time, the supercomputer is absolutely part of the telescope. We then distribute the data internationally across regional centers, and, and we expect to distribute around 700 petabytes of data a year. So this really is the cutting edge of computing. So where are we up to? Well, SKA is an um, organization of over 12 member countries. Um, and next week, in fact, I will be in Rome, um, to witness the signing of the SKA Convention. So this is like a treaty, an international treaty, between the different governments who are part of SKA. And SKA will, will then become an intergovernmental organization. Um, and we'll be ready to start building the telescope sometime, to approve that building probably sometime in the next year. But for the last four years, we will be part of designing the telescope. So there have been 11 international consortia designing different parts of the two telescopes from the fast digital signal processing that's needed through to the software that's needed and the, um, and the fiber optic network systems. Australia's been leading work on design infrastructure for in Australia, so the roads and the buildings that we'll need in order to operate the telescope, but also the fast signal processing that's used to correlate the data from the telescope and testing the different antennas that we can try out at Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory just ready for SKA so, so that we know whether or not they meet the specifications and so that we're ready to build it. So we've been doing critical design reviews and by the end of this year we expect to have a system that's agreed and tested so that we can then next year approve the design of the telescope. But you may ask, I mentioned earlier, how remote the facilities are, so why are they remote? Well, it's because of radio noise. So you know that you can't see the stars from inside the city because the light pollution. And similarly, you can't um, hear radio um, signals from the universe where it's really radio noisy. And your mobile phones and your electronics and your cars and everything give off massive amounts of radio noise. The signals that we're listening for are a million billion times quieter than your mobile phone. And so essentially, we have to go just where there are very few people. And we find that in the 
Richardson region of Western Australia. This is an area the size of the Netherlands with a population of around 100. So it's really nice and quiet for us. So I'd like to now introduce you to our observatory, the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. As I said, it's about 350 kilometers outside of Geraldton. And we built it absolutely with the SKA in mind. But even now, before the SKA, it is still host to two cutting edge world leading radio telescopes. First of all, the Australian Square Kilometer Array Pathfinder, and Bevel will talk a lot more about this in a moment. Um, but ASCAP is 36 fishes, it's 12 metres across. Um, it's in commissioning phase at the moment, we've been doing early science with it, so we've done some fantastic science. And what it has is innovative CFILO built radio cameras that will phase array things. Typical telescopes, you can only take kind of one pixel or a few pixels at a, time, a pixel at a time. But with our radio cameras, we can look at 30 degrees of the sky at a time. So we can survey the sky much faster than is usual for a radio telescope. We also host the Murchison Wide Field Array, which is a low frequency telescope. You're going for several years now. And it's really a very strong a precursor for the SKA. It's probably many of the technologies that will be used in SKA, an international project led by Curtin University. And we've been very glad to be able to host them at, at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory. But for both of these telescopes, we need this high-speed digital signal processing, and we need it to not interfere with the signals we get. So we have a control building which has two Faraday cage shields around it so that the radio signals can't leak, um, leak out. And we're also pleased to say that we believe this is the only observatory in the world that can be run off solar power alone. So we have hybrid solar diesel um, power station and we can run the observatory using solar power and, and this lithium ion battery, which at the time was Australia's largest and has since been uh, superseded by Elon Musk's battery in South Australia. Um, so that's the Virtual Surveyor Astronomy Observatory. It's going to be the site of SKA in Australia. Um, it's built on land um, owned by the, traditionally by the Wadjuri Yamaji people of Western Australia. And so we have an indigenous land use agreement with the Wadjuri Yamaji, which has allowed us to build as happened to and host the MWA, we're developing a new indigenous land use agreement to allow us to build the SKA. And so that will be a, a long term ongoing collaboration that we have with the Wadjuri Yamaji there. And so come with me 10 years into the future. And let's stand, actually, you can't come because we need to keep the radio quiet. But imagine you could. Let's stand at the Murchison Radio Astronomy Observatory in the middle of the West Australian desert and be surrounded by 130,000 antennas for Australia's first mega science project, listening to whispers from the edge of time. Thank you.